Well, this bio work, it, it, all it says is, okay, there are blocks in your system. You take out the blocks, you learn to breathe more deeply, you get more energy. Whatever's left must be more natural. If something blocked inside of you and you can take it away, makes sense. Then, then you will become more natural. And so you will discover more who you are. And that's a personal journey. No one can really give it to you. No one can tell you who you are. Devraj, it's great to have you on the podcast. I've been really looking forward to this one. And for a lot of people listening to this today, bioenergetics will be a term that's completely new to them. It, it was new to me up until maybe two or three months ago, and I've been really fascinated by everything about it. Can you please give us a, a basic explanation about what bioenergetics is for the listeners who've never come across it before? Sure, Mark, sure, of course, and, and thank you for inviting me onto your show. Bioenergetics, I mean, there's a kind of formal definition and stuff from various American practitioners and that kind of thing, but how I see it myself, it's really a kind of body-based therapy. It's a therapy thing, really. And you put your body in these weird postures and you breathe and you keep feeling your body and it starts to shift holding patterns, dead zones, the effects of trauma, the effects of conditioning out of your system. So it's fundamentally like a way of working with the body to get psychological change, to, to, to become like a more open person, a more grounded person, a person who's just, you know, a better version of yourself, as the, the Americans often put it taking out the blocks basically you know a lot of psychology is about who you should be and trying to be a certain kind of person and this approach is more that we're going to take out some of the blocks and whoever's left over afterwards will be a more natural person yeah yeah and so like you say it's a it's a body-based therapy i'll rewind a little bit because you mentioned a couple of things there a couple of terms that will be new to people you said uh holding patterns and dead zones T tell us what those actually mean well, the concept is, is that like when you're a little kid, we're very, very vulnerable and our brain, you know, we haven't really developed proper defenses. You know, when something traumatic happens or when the parents are being a bit heavy with us or whatever, some part of the brain has this role of kind of shutting us down in a sense. It may lock off certain areas of our, our natural sensation, of our natural energy. And as we grow up, you know, at some point there's a kind of choice to release and let go and go on a kind of find out who we really are. But for most people, you know, there's, there's such high levels of social conditioning in society, you know, that's not really an option. And they just, they just learn to keep things under control, basically. And holding patterns are like the physical manifestation of that or dead zones. Holding patterns are when, like if you've got a muscle or a chunk of fascia, and fascia is the in interconnecting tissue uh, in your body. When you've got a muscle, say, it can, it can form a certain locked up kind of pattern, which is tense, and it just stays like that. Like you can say, okay, finish work, want to relax now, sit in my armchair, get in a bus, but the muscle does not fully relax. It's become habituated to being in a certain tense and rather unnatural state. The opposite extreme to that is like dead zones, when literally feeling consciousness just drops out of the muscle and it becomes just completely floppy, you know, and it's just not responsive at all. In some ways, that's more extreme. Uh, but muscles, when they're healthy and when, when, when you're emotionally healthy, they're like toned, you know, so they're in between this tense held state and this sort of super floppy, there's no energy in them at all kind of state. They've got this natural toning. A big part of um, what I share in my podcast and, and some of the writing work I do for people with gut issues and ulcerative colitis is just sharing this message that we need to look up after our body holistically and, and on all levels. So physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. And I quite often find that people don't quite realise the emotional baggage they're carrying and they, they don't actually realise how much they've been repressing feelings over the years how much trauma they might be carrying and then how that can be impacting them in so many different ways. What I really loved about your book, you've obviously written a series of books about bioenergetics and I loved in the first one where well, you get straight into it straight away and you say we, we've we basically been repressing our feelings for a lot of our lives. Let's, let's elaborate a bit more about that and why bioenergetics is the, a great answer to that. Well, I mean, the two basic kind of psychological mechanisms of repression like trauma and conditioning. And I think in today's world, a lot of people talk about trauma, which is really like a kind of 
isolated incident, which is very emotionally provocative, which we shut into our system, you know, someone just coming through your boundaries really quickly in a threatening or dangerous way when you're a little kid, that kind of thing, or like you reaching out for mama and she's just not there, she's left or something like that, you know, it's the opposite kind of, these are like things which really impact our system, but in reality, you know, it's social, family, societal conditioning that actually creates a lot of the problems in my experience in that from quite early childhood, we're brought up, you know, we're social creatures as human beings. You know, we basically, we, we want to have friendships. That's like a social kind of need that we experience later on as we get older, we'll want to have love relationships to be attractive to opposite sex, same sex, whatever our orientation. A bit later on down the track, want to get a job, be a part of society, do something useful. And what we learn is that, you know, we really need to be a certain way in order to get those needs met. So how most of us go about achieving that is just to try and project outwards a certain version of ourselves that we believe will be able to get needs met. You know, someone who is perhaps confident or, or whatever, depending on our inner vision of ourselves, we try to make the best of it and project a person out to try and get, you know, a partner, try and get a job, try and get friendship. And to do this, we, we have to suppress quite a lot of our natural emotionality. Emotions are by nature quite volatile wow. energy inside of us. And this kind of conditioned mind that we develop doesn't like this a bit. So, it, it, you know, it wants to suppress, control that stuff and be able to present a nice version of ourselves out into the world. Yeah, so obviously this, a lot of this is going on at an unconscious level with people they don't realise yeah. what they're doing. They're, they're putting on this fake persona and, and doing that 24-7 is obviously going to get quite exhausting and they're not even really realising that they're pushing down these real natural feelings to try and be someone else. Um, and I can imagine how heavy that becomes on the body. Why then is bioenergetics a, a really good answer to that, the antidote to that? Well, there's nothing really so wrong with having to be a certain person in society. But if the way that you achieve that is by suppressing everything and it just stays suppressed, that is intrinsically not psychologically healthy and unlikely to be physically healthy as well. We need a way to release stuff and then we can go back and be this nice person with our mum or hanging out with the guys a bit more, the guy or trying to impress partners, you know, whatever we want to do or, or get a, a move up at work. But we need a way to stop the repression. And it is, it, it's locus is the body. It is the body that carries this stuff and our breathing that carries this stuff, the depth of our breathing. And so by putting your body in these weird postures, whatever they are, like, oh, I'm doing a little bit of it here, and then having to breathe and feel it puts our muscles under a level of kind of intelligent stress and the holding that's in them or the dead zones that are in them starts to kind of move and come out, basically. The idea is that you cannot just, for most people, they cannot just relax. If they say to them, okay, body, just relax. It might relax a bit, but it won't really relax. There's too much held in the body. There's too much held in the body. So... By putting your body in these weird positions and then breathing and feeling very important part of it, that starts to stretch certain muscles and cause the holding to come out of them. Pacific muscles get put under stress and in that stressful state, they start to kind of vibrate as you breathe and feel them more deeply and you keep them under stress and some of the holding comes out or if they're completely floppy, energy can come back into them. You, you, you may not notice this happening. You know, you're in a weird position. You may get some trembling or you may get a sensation of heat. But basically, it's like something starts to be released. And afterwards, you just feel a bit more open and, and you feel more grounded like you're present on the earth. It's kind of going around the thinking mind. The thinking mind is busy with who we are, our personality. But underneath that is the self, the traumatized kind of body where all the stuff is held. And you can just go straight in there. You don't need to go through the mind as a kind of middleman and ask its, its opinion about things and, you know, relationship with your mother and all the psychological stuff. You can just go into the body and work directly there. Yeah, and that's the thing as well. When you do go to the thinking mind, you're obviously always trying to find these answers to whatever situation you're in. And, and for anyone maybe 
doing some of these poses and getting involved in bioenergetics, they might say, well, if I'm working with my body, how do I know this is actually working? How do I know that there is any sort of release? But what I would say is you definitely do because those, I tremble like crazy when I'm in some of these moves and, and I feel the heat and I almost feel like this uh, pins and needles in, the, in my head and my fingers and my feet. And w what does that really represent when people do experience that, when they have all the trembling, they have these pins and needles, is that then a manifestation of these feelings being released, the, the, the trapped emotions leaving the body? You know, the relationship between holding the sensation, the experience of having energy in our body, of being able to move forwards and do stuff, and emotionality is a bit interweaver and complex, but essentially... Yeah, energy is bound up in the body. Energy, which ideally would be free for us to just go and use and, and have a good life with, is bound up in the body. And as you start to put your body in these positions and keep breathing nice and deep and feel, it starts to get liberated from the muscles. And there is this sometimes trembling, sensations of heat, pin, pins and needles, this kind of thing. I don't think anyone really fully understands this stuff because I don't think many people really, really study it who are like scientists and stuff like that. But the basic way you know is that, you know, you just feel better afterwards. You feel, people feel lighter as a general rule. Now, you can get big releases for a while, and then at some point it'll flatline a bit. And there, there are many times when it's really, really confrontational, when your sense of identity of who you are is strongly challenged by that, emotions coming up from the past, whatever. So it's not a completely smooth journey for the average person. They generally get big releases. They feel better. They're very enthusiastic. And then there's times when it's just really a struggle to keep going and you need a certain level of discipline or support often. Tell us about your involvement and how long have you been practicing bioenergetics? How long have you been coaching it for? And, and what has it done for you and your own life personally? Well, I mean, I started to get involved in therapy about 25 years ago. I was in my 30s. I dropped out really of society at the age of about 21. I was very traumatized from my early childhood and abandoned by my original parents and all sorts of heavy stuff. And I just, I felt like at some point in my 30s, I was, my life was a mess. It was just a disaster and it wasn't going to get any better. And so basically I was just casting around for therapy and looking for something quite extreme because when I'm, I was kind of super motivated to create change, I had some insight that I really wasn't happy, but my life wasn't working and I really wanted to change it. And, and so I, I eventually got involved in a lot of very intense group therapy in Holland uh, from spiritual community people. And, and it was just like, I just got totally embedded in that for quite a long time a lot of screaming and shouting and just really full on kind of not sleeping very much therapeutic work in the group room with large groups of people. And somewhere at the end of that, I kind of came out uh, as, as more of a therapist myself, uh, came out of the process. And, you know, I've been given feedback to be a therapist and uh, I've gone through a deep journey myself. And uh, I started to lead kind of group process work, but then I discovered at some point it wasn't so much my thing and I was casting around for something else that I could lead in the city and also work one-to-one -one with people. And I came up with bioenergetics and had kind of Reiki and work, which is similar, because I had done quite a lot of that in my group therapy training. And so I just started to teach about stuff. I was good at holding space. So I just got into bio. And then at some point, I kind of developed a YouTube channel on it more just out of interest, really. And then that just took off slowly over the years and people got into it and I became full-time working pretty, pretty much online, particularly from the pandemic on when I couldn't run workshops anymore. Yeah. And, and for anyone whose ears pricked up there with the YouTube thing, I think your YouTube channel is brilliant. There's so much content in there. And for anyone who's feeling a pull towards this, I would definitely recommend checking out your YouTube channel just to, to see visually what a lot of these moves are like. And you obviously get a lot more detail. So I take it your the channel is just your name, isn't it? Devaraj Sandberg. Yeah, I think because it's such a weird kind of name. If you if you put it into Google, uh, and then you're going to find me, and you'll certainly find me on YouTube. I've got like hundreds of videos. You know, I mean, it's a bit of a mess the channel because I just make stuff and whatever. You know, and it's more talking these days. But there's a lot of there's a lot of action video in there which are really going into detail because when I started it about. Eight years ago, there, there there wasn't really any information online. There's a lot of theoretical books and some people talking at length, 
but no one was really saying, this is how you do this exercise, yeah. put your body like this, pay attention to this, this kind of thing. So that's what my whole approach was to make it ultra practical. So you have heaps and heaps of stuff online. Like the most powerful, you can search for something called the bow and the arch, which is like a foundational posture or a pair of postures in bioenergetics. And, and they will give you a lot and a good intro just to see if this is something that you could get into. What would you say are some of the, the key benefits that people can experience with bioenergetics if they decide they're going to give it a go? I think basically if, if you stick with it over time, you will get definitely increased energy. You just feel like you've got more energy. Uh, you will have, you know, more natural fluidity with emotions. And there's a sense that you're kind of more okay to be vulnerable if the situation requires it. And you're more okay to take a position, be a bit angry or put down boundaries if the situation requires it. And relating to having a lot more energy, you know, it's like it, it kind of keeps you a little bit young, at least in your energy. I, I don't make a lot of medical claims for this stuff because I know some people in this field do, but I don't feel that's always, you know, can really be backed up by science because no one studies this stuff. But it's certainly not going to do your health any harm and it will keep you kind of feeling young, you know. It gives you a sense that you can still enjoy life. I'm in my 60s, you know, and I have this feeling like I can, I can enjoy life. I can go out and do stuff. I'm not physically limited. For a while, I've worked with quite a lot of people who are pretty wealthy, Americans and stuff. And I, I would see a lot of these guys had a lot of money. They'd achieved a lot, but they kind of worked so hard that their health was degenerating by their 60s and 70s, and they could no longer really enjoy life. And I think when you're in your 20s, you don't care about this stuff. You just think, well, I'm just going to, you know, just charge ahead and do my thing. But when you get in your 30s, 40s, 50s, especially 40s and 50s, if you start to take good choices and get involved with stuff like this, I think unless you're unlucky, you could be healthy up into your 60s and 70s and still go out and do a lot of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you can still have a great life. And I think bioenergetics to me is like a cornerstone of that. Certainly for me personally, it is. So I've heard you say on your, your YouTube channel and some of your videos a few times that people end up with these muscle tensions and the holding patterns because they're trying to be someone else, because they're not being authentically themselves. I find that really interesting. Please elaborate a bit more on that. Well, yeah, the, you know, the, this is the social conditioning that we go through. You know, it's like, you've got to be this kind of person to fit in. So we just try and get it together. And some people are more visually or obviously successful at it. They're good at appearing confident. They're good at appearing like they've got it all together. And, and others maybe don't feel like they can do quite so well with it. We're all in this kind of league table in our own mind somewhere and in society. But that's all kind of superficial stuff, really. And, you know, very few people go through life with much interest in who they really are. Most people are like, well, better not look, you know. Uh, just, just, just try and keep getting needs met, try and feel good about myself, try and get through the day, that kind of thing. Mm. But for some people, maybe, I don't know, 5% of people in society, they do become interested either through some crisis which happens in their life or just because they're just, they, 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 they kind of do somehow become interested, you know, who really am I? Am I just this conditioned creature trying to fit in with society, trying to keep my relationships together, trying to do this, trying to do that? Or is there some deeper meaning to me? And then that's that they start to get involved in a personal journey. And why bioenergetics is good with that is because what it really does is take out blocks. At some point, you know, if, you, if you're on it in a journey, you realize you cannot just keep putting on different masks. That's not going to really lead you anywhere. And, and with psychology, it's more, okay, I learned how to be, you know, fluid and be this person when I'm hanging out with my mom or this person when I'm hanging out with my guys or my partners or whatever, you know, but psychology also cannot really take you much deeper. But with this bio work, it, it, all it says is, okay, there are blocks in your system. You take out the blocks, you learn to breathe more deeply, you get more energy, whatever's left must be more natural. If something's blocked inside of you and you can take it away, makes sense. Then, then you will become more natural. And so you will discover more who you are. And that's a personal journey. No one can really give it to you. No one can tell you who you are. It can't, it can't be done. It's a, a personal journey that you can get on, that, that you can find out about yourself. Yeah, and then obviously if, if people are living this more authentic version of themselves, 
you can just imagine that that's going to have a positive knock-on effect on their health. They're going to be healthier, more vibrant people as well. Yeah, you know, it gives you more resilience. I mean, you, you can flesh it out a bit. There are kind of two poles of emotionality, which are really anger, trying to hold boundaries, keep stuff out that hasn't been invited in, basically, and sadness, pain, emotional pain, vulnerability, not getting a need met, wanting something and not being able to get it. It's the opposite. And for most people, they are not confident with feeling or showing those feelings from both those directions. And, that, you know, that's not their own fault in any way. It's just the social conditioning they've been through. And the culture I was brought up in, in the 60s and 70s, men, you know, it was okay to be angry, one of the guys and be pissed off, get in a fight. It wasn't okay to cry or be vulnerable in any way. And the opposite kind of applied to women. I mean, things have changed a little bit these days, but that's still very strong in a lot of cultures. And yet, there's nothing genetically different about women that means they can't be angry or hold boundaries. And there's nothing genetically different about men, which means they, they can't allow themselves to be vulnerable. When you can allow vulnerability, you know, you, you can really feel the vulnerability. And when you can hold proper boundaries clearly, then a lot more options are open to you in life. It's like people block themselves off from situations because of fear of who they might be in that situation. People don't go, people learn to please and not go into a situation which might be confrontational because they won't be able to please their way out of it. And that's because they don't feel confident holding boundaries around people. And likewise, people do avoid situations where they might get overly emotional and start crying or something like that because they don't feel confident around that emotion, who they might be in that situation. You know, is it all going to fall apart? And, and because of that, we end up kind of on a very small track in life, like our behavioral box is kind of limited and we mm. don't start, we don't keep doing new things or because, you know, we get in this track with who we're comfortable with being and who we know we can get through our life being and through our day being, but it's not, you know, it's not really that satisfying. What's more exciting, of course, is to be able to have this sensation, even at an older age, that, hey, I can go out and just I can go in this new situation and, okay, if it all goes wrong, I can be emotionally present with what happens. I can communicate. I will be okay. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. You put that so well. Now, you something that I've, I've heard you proclaim in your, your videos before is that bioenergetics is better than yoga. So obviously both of them do postures, but why would you say that bioenergetics is, is better than yoga? Well, I think I made some video with that title a long time ago. And, you know, it was a bit of a clickbaity kind of title. <laughs> it's not really about biogenics being better than yoga. Yoga has a specific kind of, well, it has various specific intentions. Originally, it was like a spiritual thing, asana, asana, it was to, was to prepare you for like a spiritual journey, getting your body strong and open enough. In the West, it's more like a type of calisthenics just to create some flexibility and also for people to feel good. If you do yoga, you usually feel good afterwards. With bioenergetics, its specific intention is to release holding patterns, trap psychological stuff, allow energy to flow. So there is, there, there's, there is focus on the posture, but there's also focus, a lot of focus on, on breathing more deeply and really feeling your body. And so the intention when you're doing it is different. And also the intention behind the actual practice as people have created it, you know, is, is to open ourselves up energetically, emotionally. And yoga is a different thing. There's a different intention there. So for anyone who's maybe interested in bioenergetics and, and they want to get started on it, do you have any advice for them to, to begin? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can just go to my YouTube channel. I mean, I also have a website, Bioenergetics Org UK. Uh, you can check that. But you can also just check for me on YouTube and look for some of my more popular videos. Probably you'll see something like Bow and Arch there. And just give that a try. You know, just get into it for a while, maybe try it like ideally daily, but maybe five times a week for like um, a month and just see if your life feels better. Yeah. You mentioned there that the bow and the arch. So th those are the two like foundational postures, aren't they? And if it, and if someone was going to give them a go in their practice and how long should they stand in each posture for and how many like rounds should they do it for? How long would I suppose the, the, the workout, if you can call it that, how long should that generally take? 
Well, I, I recommend for most people, you, you, you can't say for certain where it depends where someone's at and, and body stuff, but try 90 seconds. I have some ding tracks. It's good to use a ding track, not look at a clock or a watch because it'll take you out of the process. Uh, but you can download from my website and you put on a 90 second one, set it to repeat. So you get a little ding, nice little ding, not too intrusive every 90 seconds. And you, you, you move between the postures. So 90 seconds up in this bow and then straight down into the arch, you know, moving quite slowly, but straight down into the arch, no break, go into a second rep, go into a third rep. That's like nine minutes, basically no break in between. And if for 90 seconds, and then take two dings just to lie on the floor and feel your body at the end. That's very important. It's part of the practice because that's often when a lot of change happens, but if 90 seconds is too much and it feels particularly like maybe hanging in the arch, you might hurt your lower back. I mean, you can't put your hands on your knees or your elbows on your knees to take pressure off, especially when you're just starting. You can always try it with 60 seconds, 45 seconds. And if 90 seconds is really easy, take it up to two minutes. You don't initially need to do much longer time. People often ramp up the time, you know, starting three, four, five minutes, but they don't really breathe and feel. They're just clinging on in the posture and it doesn't achieve so much. You ideally want to be giving like a third of your attention to the posture, a third of your attention to uh, your breathing, trying to breathe quite deeply, and a third of your attention to being aware of your body. People tend to overfocus on the posture. You want the posture right, but it's not the be all and end all. You've got to get that breathing deep and really try to feel your body and then you'll get the release and the change. Yeah, th and thanks for sharing that. And for the people listening just now, I know it is quite hard to explain all of this when you're listening to it through the audio, but that's another reason to check out David Adjie's YouTube channel. I'll include a link to that in the show notes along with a link to your website as well. So this has been a, an amazing chat. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for, for chatting with us today and all the best. My pleasure, Mark. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you.